Dr. Jean Chamberlain Froze is a Canadian obstetrician gynecologist whose work has taken her to some of the many neglected mothers in the developing world. And she's chronicled several of their stories in this book, Where Have All the Mothers Gone? When in Canada, she's based in Hamilton, Ontario, where she's assistant professor at McMaster University and executive director of Save the Mothers. Jean, welcome back to 100 Huntley Street. Great to be here. Good to have you. So let's get started with exactly what is Save the Mothers. Well, Anne, I guess the bigger question is why save the mothers? Mm. And really, as we look worldwide, over half a million mothers die from pregnancy complications that are preventable, and they estimate that four million babies are either born stillborn or die in their first week of life because of unsafe motherhood. Mm. And really, as we look worldwide, we realize that so many of these deaths could have been prevented. So save the mothers is about trying to change that situation, but it's not a medical solution. It's a societal change. It's advocacy. Mm. It's getting people outside of the hospital involved in trying to save the lives of mothers because they can be saved. They can be saved and that is such an important point to make that mm -hmm. so many of these maternal deaths are preventable. Mm -hmm. Now you chronicle in your book so many, the statistics are just astounding. Mm -hmm. um, you say that more women have died in Africa of, mm -hmm. of pregnancy-related deaths than have died of HIV-AIDS. That's right. When we look between 1980 and the year 2000, more women during that time mm -hmm. uh, died of uh, pregnancy-related complications. That's right. And I think most people around the world don't realize that. Mm -hmm. And uh, compare it to our Western society and the, the deaths we have in Canada mm -hmm. every year are tragic, but mm -hmm. the numbers are very low mothers who die in uh, childbirth Absolutely. compared to African That's mothers. That's right. Well, compare Uganda and Canada, mm -hmm. approximately the same population, close to 30 million people. And in Canada, we lose about 10 to 15 mothers every year. And, and unfortunately, of course, when they happen, it makes the front pages of the mm -hmm. newspaper because it's uh, obviously a, a it's great tragedy. It's really here. And a great tragedy. Absolutely. Uh, and those women die in situations where they're being cared for, where the doctors are working their hardest. Mm -hmm. I've dealt with one maternal death my whole um, time as a physician, uh, which is actually a long time now. Here in Canada. Here in Canada. And yet in Uganda, same population, they lose 6,000 mothers every year from pregnancy related complications. And only just recently are we actually even uh, noting the names of these mothers who died. Mm. Before that, they just died and nobody even noted their names. Mm. Uh, so now things are starting to change, but uh, there's mm -hmm. obviously a huge mountain that needs to be climbed. You know, that's what I really, one of the things I really appreciate about your book is that you give those mothers names. You tell their mm -hmm. stories. Each chapter is devoted mm -hmm. to a different woman who mm -hmm. has gone through labor and delivery. Mm -hmm. Some of them have mm -hmm. come through and are living and mm -hmm. taking care of their child, while others, mm -hmm. unfortunately, didn't make it through the labor and delivery process. That's and right. You'd chronicle their stories and some of them are mm -hmm. so heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. I think of Charity, 18-year-old mm -hmm. Charity. Tell us about mm -hmm. her story. Well, Charity I uh, was pregnant and uh, as most women in, in Africa are actually pregnant by the time they're uh, 20 years of age, very, very common. And in her situation, she went into labor and uh, there wasn't the care there that she needed. And uh, she initially went to one hospital, uh, which wasn't a big enough, it was more like a clinic really, and the people that were there uh, couldn't look after her. And so she was then transferred to another, but it took several days before she was transferred. In and labor. In the labor whole the whole time. time, exactly. And uh, she ended up dying and it was many, the many delays that led mm -hmm. to her to her death that was just a real tragedy now was she the one that had the baby was breech that's right exactly and uh, you know they were the at the first uh, little clinic they were hoping that she would deliver and they mm -hmm. were hoping and hoping and hoping mm -hmm. and then eventually transferred her to the other hospital but by that time she'd been in labor for two or three days mm -hmm. and didn't get a cesarean section early enough and mm -hmm. so she uh, died and her mother was there with her mm -hmm. uh, the, w the mother had actually already lost a daughter uh, from pregnancy complications and just couldn't believe that this was was happening again but it's it's these delays in the decisions uh, mm -hmm. to care for these women that ended up uh, uh, taking her life and, of course, the life of her baby as well. Of course. Now, a lot of these uh, little villages have no professional medical help. Uh, some of them don't even have midwives. They just mm -hmm. have the grandmother or the mother-in-law right. or the mother who has gone through childbirth, mm -hmm. and so she's there to mm -hmm. help best she can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But how do we then... Uh, get these young mothers to medical help mm -hmm. when it's so far away, the mm -hmm. distance. I mean, you say in your book that maternity care in developing countries is like walking across Niagara Falls on a chain rope. Mm 
each link in the chain is one component. Mm -hmm. What are those components? Well, there's like three major links, and the first one is the decision to seek care. That's, as you say, out mm -hmm. in the village, the woman and her family, because you see, in most developing countries, women don't make their own decision. You wouldn't make the decision to go see a doctor. It would be your husband or male relative that would make that decision for you. Mm -hmm. So that's the first decision, uh, to actually seek care, that there's something wrong and we need to be uh, moving out. And of course, that d decision is influenced by finance. If you don't have any money, yeah. of course, you're not going to move out. And uh, in most uh, countries around the world, health care is not free like it is here in Canada. So um, so that first decision is, is the first delay. And then the second delay, of course, is the transportation. Mm. I mean, the little bus that went through your village may have already left uh, this morning and is not coming again until tomorrow or the day after, etc. So transportation is a big problem. The roads are often very difficult to maneuver. And then, of course, the rains. Uh, we know when it's pouring, pouring rain, nobody wants to go out, let alone to take this woman who can't stop her own labor. You can't mm -hmm. just turn no. off the key and say, you know, let's, let's wait till tomorrow when the weather's better. And then finally and tragically, when you arrive at the health facility, whatever it is, as in the case of Charity, where she actually mm -hmm. did arrive at a facility, but, you know, they didn't have the medications that she needed, they didn't have the treatment that she needed. Uh, sometimes even at the bigger facilities, you know, they'll run out of um, electricity, they'll run out of uh, oxygen. I mean, very basic uh, mm -hmm. things that are needed to save a mother's life. There may be no doctor around because they're on, on leave or have left for some reason. And um, so the, the facilities are not always guaranteed. I mean, if, if a person walked into a hospital here in Canada and there was no doctor around and they died as a result of it, there would be a huge inquiry. There would be, you know, no, mm -hmm. no uh, limit to what would happen as a result of that. But in many um, African countries, I mean, that's just the, the daily way of life. And it's very difficult for the healthcare workers dealing it with that kind of uh, situation where they have so few resources as mm -hmm. well. Mm. Now, you mentioned in the book um, so many stories, mm. and I so enjoyed reading this book and really getting to know the mothers on the mm. other side of the world and how they live and what they go through when mm. they do give birth. I've had three yeah. children myself, and so I could so relate mm. to some of the stories of, of just the fear and the unknown yeah. and, and the pain and, yeah. and the expectation. Um, Tell us about Motorcycle Annie, mm. because she really is a hero mm. That's to many, right. isn't she? That's right. Well, she is a midwife, a skilled attendant, uh, working out in a rural area in uh, Zambia. And, you know, I visited her one time, Anne, and I, when I walked away from there, I just thought, you know, that lady is a very, very special lady. Mm -hmm. I mean, she is out there working with few resources, nobody acknowledges her work, and yet she's saving the lives of many, many people. And the story, mm -hmm. as I tell about in the book, is, is a woman who comes in to see her uh, and quickly realizes that this woman needs more care than what she can give at her uh, rural clinic so she straps her on the back of her motorbike straps her to herself and they go down this bumpy road I mean I, ro I drove on this road yeah. in a car and I, I thought I was gonna be sick let alone be on the back of a motorcycle <gasps> in labor in labor now you go into more detail in the book because actually this particular evening was Annie's wedding anniversary mm, that's right her yeah. family was yeah. waiting for her back home her daughters had fixed yeah. a meal and they were gonna celebrate together yeah just yeah. locking up the clinic and yeah. in comes this distraught man yeah. with his wife and his wife had been in labor for a yeah. while yeah so they do she straps her on the back of yeah. the motorcycle and then what happens well they just <coughs> bump down the road and uh, eventually get to the hospital but of course Annie knew this hospital and that's where she would take uh, patients that were were in in problems and um, you know it was it was just a great story I thought of, of a woman who mm -hmm. just was giving everything as you say yeah. I mean you sort of think well it's it's my special night you know mm -hmm. I, I shouldn't have to work tonight and yet she was willing to to give up her evening and go and, yeah. and take this woman uh, who really need, needed the care just very selfless yeah for know. sure and there's there's hundreds of thousands of healthcare workers around the world that are like that Anne, mm -hmm. and they're working as hard as they can but the problem is the patients are coming in too late mm. you know and even the healthcare workers themselves aren't valued in the in the community you know mm -hmm. and so we need to we need to value women more and value the healthcare workers and do what we can do to really make sure that they have what they need I mean if you plunked me in the middle of Africa without the medications that I needed without the tools etc I would there would be very little I could right. do is as a skilled physician to help somebody and that's really what these healthcare workers are dealing with is very little and yet you know I joke about the fact that coca-cola reaches the remotest villages in Uganda mm. you will find it way out there if you need a coke or a Fanta mm. it will be there and and so we also can get the equipment there mm -hmm. if we value women enough mm. we can make sure that that equipment gets there and that's really what we're trying to do with the mm -hmm. Save the Mothers program is say you know yeah we need to have good skilled healthcare workers there but we also need to equip them we need to equip their hospitals their facilities 
-hmm. make sure they have the motorcycle, whatever that they is right. that they need uh, to help them, the mothers. And Save the Mothers has actually gotten international attention. This is the standard. Your husband writes is a journalist with this particular newspaper, right. is that right? And the first lady of Uganda actually came and um, gave some recognition to save the mothers. Tell That's us, right. what, yeah. what did that do for your, your organization when she came by? Well, Honorable Janet Seventy is the First Lady of Uganda. She's also a member of Parliament herself. And we invited her, because we actually have four members of Parliament in the Save the Mothers program, and we invited her as a special guest uh, for Women's Day, which is in March of mm -hmm. every year, uh, to really g give an opportunity to honor safe motherhood and to say, what can we be doing in Uganda as a nation, not mm -hmm. just even small little projects, but as a nation mm -hmm. uh, to talk about safe motherhood. So it was just wonderful to have her mm -hmm. there. She actually said that she wanted to join the program herself, uh, which was exciting. And I think she yes. really meant that she was she would like to do that. So uh, She's that's a, a lovely follower of Jesus. She and, is, yeah. And very bold.